So thank you to everyone for joining. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you joining the panel. Today, we're going to talk about risk, which is, I don't know, a huge topic when it comes to, well, life, I suppose. There's you know, everyday risks we take as people. There's risks we take as investors. There's, I mean, it's a, it's a massive topic. So I don't know. We'll kind of bisect this one in, in, in various ways. Um, but I guess, like, from my perspective as an, as an investor, I feel like we're seeing more and more risks. I feel like they're coming at us faster and faster than they used to. I think about my experience um, in the markets anyway, and not long after I left uni, there was the GFC, and then there was you know, major political change, there was the pandemic, there's climate threats. I mean, it just seems like just one thing after another, these risks are accelerating. So I used to tell people that you know, in the 10-year bear market, or excuse me, bull market we were in, the biggest risk was not being invested at all. And now it's, well, geez, I don't know. You know, you should really think about reallocating things, cash, fixed interest, and what have you. So I think it's a very interesting time to be talking about risk because, you know, things have changed, certainly. So why don't we just go uh, down the panel and just, um, well, Prashant's done the introductions already. So maybe just, um, I don't know, just touch on your background when it comes to risk at all in terms of how you think about risk. Rachel, if we could start with you. Okay, so Rachel Waterhouse, the ASA is Australian Shareholders Association, and I have a background in um, governance that you've probably heard of, and risk is often spoken about in governance and how you manage companies. So I think the challenge is that often with risk, we're looking at the what can go wrong, and obviously market risk is there. You could lose a portfolio or an asset class or a share, but there is also reward as well. So really thinking about your risk tolerances and what they are and what the rewards are is also really important. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's how we would think about risk. And being share, shares, um, investors really need to think about that asset allocation. And although we advocate for shareholders, you really need to be invested in many different things. Yeah. Mark, how about you? Background in risk. We know you hold the CFA, of course. So yeah, I mean, I, you I could speak at nauseum about <laughs> all the measurements, the Greeks of, of risk, right? Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I think it's evolved over time, and and honestly, it's evolved a lot to sort of Morningstar's view of the world. That I will say that, you know, when I was in grad school and I was studying for the CFA, yes, I was very interested in beta and standard deviation and all these different risk measures. And I think as I got a little bit older, I just started to think a lot of these don't matter to me. And I still, despite all the jokes about my age, I still have a while to go before retirement. And so I think I've become very comfortable with volatility. And I realize it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how much money is in my super two weeks from now. It doesn't matter how much is in two years from now. What really matters is actually when I hit retirement. And I think that there's so many and kind of, I guess, where my interests have gone to is there's so many behavioral issues that are holding investors back. And so I've just been trying to come up with ways over my kind of investing life to ignore things. And it's harder at some times. It was obviously harder when the markets were dropping after COVID. Um, it was harder. You mentioned the GFC. I'm apparently older than you because I was in uni <laughs> during the dot-com bubble bursting. That was hard. And that I've just been really trying to come up with ways to figure out, okay, what are ways that I can ignore this and focus on what's important to me? And that's really what I need to achieve goals. So yeah, I'd say it's evolved mm. and I think it's evolved to a good place. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that I know that you're older than me. That was my entire goal to figure out how old you were in this panel. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's a secret, but so. We, we do see the, the kind of ignoring factor at work at ShareSite. We see when markets are not doing well, our engagement really starts to drop off. So it's a bit of a, you know, that is quite interesting. So anyway. Which isn't a bad thing, right? Not because at the end of the day, it's the people that are checking their portfolio every five minutes while sure. the market's dropping that are more likely to do something. Sure. And most of the time when we do something, it's not good. Mm. And Danielle, your, your, your overall take on risk. Your, how do you, what's your, your involvement yourself as an investor with risk? Yeah, risk is a really interesting concept. You framed it in terms of volatility. Uh, I think that sometimes is a bit of a narrow definition because volatility means that you get some awful shocks like we're seeing in reporting season at the moment. So lots of examples, WiseTech down 20% today, other stocks up 20% tomorrow. 
but that volatility doesn't become a risk to your portfolio unless you actually act on it. So you have to actually say, oh my gosh, I have to sell these shares because they're going down. You know, the, the whole narrative or story or the company that I believed in is going to hell you know, handbasket it and you throw it out with the baby in the bathwater. So the first thing is, from a technical perspective, it may be volatility, but for the average person, the you and the me in the street who invest um, our money, I guess it's more about having a definition of how you are trying to grow your wealth over time and acknowledging what your risk parameters are, so what you're comfortable with. And when I wrote the Shareplicity books, I always came back to the fact that my own personal story, my childhood, when mum lost all her money on um, the uh, Poseidon, the stock from the 70s, some of you may remember it, and she was deeply traumatised, almost had a nervous breakdown over it. And as a young child, I was deeply impacted. So my whole life and career has been around creating financial security. So I've always been a, a huge saver and uh, arguably I'm too risk averse on some occasions. So once you can acknowledge which type of person you are, how you see risk, whether you're a great, if you're a huge risk taker, then you have to be prepared to possibly be very diversified because if you're going to go into uh, private equity or venture capital, you just don't do one exposure, of which I managed to do and quietly, you know, wrote off 25,000 pounds, which was, you know, <laughs> I could afford to at the time, but I wouldn't do it now. So I think it's very personal and I think it depends depends on your journey of what you're trying to achieve and, and, and that's why it's sometimes I think very uh, challenging for people to get around risk because my risk is different mm. to your risk. It, it is such a great point about how personal it is. I reflect on my father who was just in town visiting for a couple of months, he just flew out this morning. He for 37 years was a commodities trader on the trading floor in Chicago. And you talk about risk. I mean, that is risky. And, and I saw that growing up. And his idea of a diversification was, well, I'm not going to be in corn futures. I'm going to branch out and buy some S&P 500 futures. You know? <laughs> it's like, and that's why I just like blue chip stocks. I'm, I'm, I'm much more, I think, aligned with, with you, Danielle, on that. Um, oh, that's, that's, that is very interesting. So I guess to kind of, I don't know, try to draw up some kind of contemporary today examples, I just want to go around the panel quickly. Like, what? What risks are, are keeping you awake at night, Rachel? What, what are you thinking about right now in terms of risk? What's, what are you thinking about in terms of how you might change or your allocation or your portfolio? Okay, so I'll talk about our members first. Please and do. then yeah. my, myself um, second. Um, what our members often talk about is diversification and not feeling that they are diversified enough. We also see that in the ASX investor study that came through showing that a lot of investors and I think there's 9 million investors in shares don't feel that they're diversified enough and women in particular. So, you know, thinking through, is my portfolio, is it how it should be? Is it got the right weightings? Uh, members often comment around, maybe I've got too many bank stocks, mining stocks. So those are the things to really think about. The other, the second point that ASA often talks about, which is similar to what Mark was saying, is avoid the noise. So we've got noise, we turn on the TV, we look at our phones as soon as we wake up. But that could actually, the behavioural side could make you make a decision that's not the best decision for you. So, so that's as far as our members. Myself, what keeps me awake? Well, I try not to look at my share portfolio too often. I mean, it's really easy to do that, but I have to remind myself of the time horizon. We've all got different personal investment plans and time horizons. And for me, I'm leaving a lot of things for the long run and, and taking advantage of compound interest. But that's not everyone's situation. Some people really need that income generation and need to be thinking about that. And when the market downturns, then that is a concern and people get worried. But you need to think about what's your financial plan. And if you don't have one written down, you can do it yourself, you can get advice, put that down and think about what are my goals, how am I tracking, um, what would be successful. Mm. 
And just specifically on, on the point of your members, you mentioned kind of the split between miners and banks. Are, are we thinking, are they talking about overseas investment exposure yeah, there? Yeah, that's the other point, I actually. Realize it's, really the, good. it's the Australian shareholders, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, talking about like the, the 2%, you know, exchange yeah. of Australia versus having international shares, that's the reflection also often of our shareholders is, well, maybe I've got too much in the Australian shares. So thinking about how do you get access, how do you diversify, do you go into exchange-traded funds, those are the things often our members are thinking about. But often with ETFs, if you've got five ETFs, you've really got to know what's in those five ETFs because they may be the same companies and therefore you're not as diversified as you think you are. Mm. So I guess thinking about, you know, where, what's the weighting of your portfolio? Do you have enough access to international shares? And really avoid the noise. It's, it's hard, it's super hard to avoid the, the news in the morning, um, but you really need to think long-term. If long-term is your plan, some people do need their cash within one to two mm. years because they've got plans of a fabulous holiday or something else that they want to do. Yeah, you make that point about ETF concentration and overlap. I mean, right now, the stat escapes me, but the returns of the S&P 500 are coming from, what, seven, eight, ten stocks in one of those ETFs? So, yeah, mm. exactly. Um, Mark, risks on your mind, either from a house view at Morningstar or, or you personally? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the first thing I wanted to say is that there are always hundreds of reasons not to invest. And I think one of the problems we get into and what we forget is that at any point in time, there are all these risks floating around, whether they are actually come to fruition or just something we're worried about. And I want to start off there. I also want to say that, you know, one of the problems that investors have is the idea that you need to constantly adjust your portfolio to what's actually happening right now. And I think that's really dangerous because number one, a lot of people, of course, are wrong. And you know, even if we, <laughs> if we talk about a risk that's happening right now, of course, everyone's hearing about China and the issues happening with China. Well, if you went and found an AFR from the beginning of this year, what did every portfolio manager tell you to do? <laughs> Invest in China. Yeah. So I think we just have to be really careful about this need to constantly adjust our portfolio based on what's happening. And you know, I think right now the thing, and you know, this is obviously a larger risk, I guess the thing that I would be most worried about is the level of debt in the world. Mm. And you know, S&P put out this study at the end of 2022, just looking at really from the GFC and when interest rates originally went down, obviously all the way through COVID, how much debt has been taken out by countries, by companies, by individuals. And even if we sit here and we talk about some of the things happening in Australia, if we just look at mortgages, so if you go back to 1970, obviously a little while, mortgage debt in Australia was about 10% of GDP, and it's now 90%. Mm -hmm. And certainly we are hearing a lot, and that's how, it's 90%, and a third of all houses are actually fully paid off. So it's a lot of debt being held by a small amount of, or a relatively small amount of homeowners. So. Yeah, I mean, I think debt more than anything mm. else. And obviously with interest rates going up, and I personally think that they are going to stay up for a while. I think that all of this interest rates are going back down to where they were is a little bit of a pipe dream and wishful thinking by people. So yeah, I think debt and things that start blowing up, and that's what we're seeing in China, right? Mm. Especially with a lot of the property developers and how yeah. much debt they have. Yeah. And Danielle, what, what risk concerns are on your mind at the moment? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Debt's really um, interesting to focus on because debt around the world has gone up massively and I know that we talk about our debt, so I think we've got some of the highest per capita debt because of mortgages here in Australia, but China is the one of the most indebted countries in the world, but it's not an open economy. Uh, yeah, debt has gone up hugely, but what does that debt do to economies? It actually slows down GDP growth. It acts as a depressant. Okay, so the more debt you have, the more debt you need to grow an economy. So once upon a time, um, I can't remember the exact ratio, but you actually need to add more debt to get growth, particularly with ageing populations. Does that keep me awake at night? Definitely not. I had the privilege under my wonderful new job at AusBiz to speak to Bill Browder, 
who is quite famous for writing Red Notice, and uh, a very interesting story, the Magnitsky Act of which he was involved in. And why is this important? He is an, was an emerging markets investor, one of the largest in the 1990s, and I used to work at a company called Bearings, which was a very large emerging markets fund until we blew up, so speak about risk. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, my point is, is that we focused on geopolitical risk, and I agree with him. I think geopolitical risk has not only changed, but it is amplifying. You are seeing a dividing of the world. As we speak, we have the BRIC nations meeting down in South Africa, BRIC being Brazil, Russia, India and China. And uh, Putin can't go because he might be arrested, but hey-ho. Uh, but the point is, is the world, having been so, I suppose, open to global trade, it grew post-World War II, if you're looking at long secular trends, that is being broken at the moment. So how do you invest around that? How do you invest around something like climate change, which is a massive systemic risk to every business, to every society out there? And I think it goes back to the fundamental fundamental thing, you don't want to stay awake at night, you know, going on about these things, because it'll do your head in completely. But companies have survived over the longer term. They have survived through wars, they've survived through pandemics. And a very wise fund manager, again, through Ausbiz, who I've had the pleasure of speaking to, called Alan McFarlane, who's a very, they're called the canny Scots, because they're very astute fund managers. And he focused it right back on the thing. You want to own those great companies that can generate cash flow, that can produce dividends and have that resilience. And one way of mitigating the risk in your portfolio is investing in great companies that have the capacity to go through cycles. Now, the problem then becomes is that there's not a lot of them. <laughs> and that's when it gets very challenging. And that's what Warren Buffett would say. And if you want to look into research, there's a gentleman called Professor Hendrik Bessenbinder who does amazing research about how few companies actually produce the returns for investors. So what I'm saying is rather than being stressed about the events that you can't control, you can you you look to what you can control. So, for example, rather than investing in emerging markets directly, by the way, Bill Browder will never touch an emerging market with a dictator or anything again. <laughs> Too much sovereign risk. And you are seeing that play out. But you can buy a, a Unilever or a Coca-Cola or an Apple, by way of example, to give yourself exposure, global exposure. So I would say bring the risk on board of what you can control as opposed to what you can't control. Mm. Yeah, and if we could just stay with that, Danielle, uh, and we'll move on to the next question, which is, it sounds to me like you're describing economic moats in, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah, well, the companies would have that characteristic mm -hmm. of an economic moat. Yep. Clearly, they would. But resilience is almost what you're looking for in companies. And I heard, I, I'll admit, I own a company called Eli Lilly, and I kind mm -hmm. of tripped all over it. But you would have heard of it because they're very much involved in the diabetes drug that is now a weight loss drug that's getting FDA approval. Well, this company, it's, it's up hugely. It's probably now a momentum trade, et cetera, et cetera. But it's back to its 1953 <laughs> share price really? overnight. How, like, kind of does that do your head in? Imagine if you'd bought it back in 1953, the roller coaster ride you would have had. But yet, there's a whole new crop of investors. So. That is a company. Some companies show resilience that have moats, but they change over time. That's, that's a really good point. I've, I've got young kids, and I'm, I'm investing on their behalf, and I, don't, I, I think about it so differently than my own portfolio management decisions, and basically I just buy Apple shares for them. I, you know, and it's, it's, that's, a, that's a good example. Mark, any specific, um, be they indicators, ratios, I hate to get too technical, but anything you look at, when you're assessing risk in your own portfolio or what Morningstar kind of believes in when it comes to risk and how to kind of quantify it? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned moats, and obviously it's something that Morningstar does talk about a lot, but we also have a rating called the uncertainty rating. And, you know, I think obviously when you are investing, you are buying a company. And I think we all need to understand that different companies have different types of business risk, right? And that's not any sort of risk that has to do with the share market. It has to do with the risk of that actual company. And I think it's just getting comfortable. So, you know, a very simplified example is that a large multinational company that's been around forever, that has multiple product lines, that has a low debt, has a very different risk profile to a very small miner who is hopefully going to find something and hopefully not run out of money before they actually <laughs> dig it out of the earth. No and I think people that, lose yeah. sight of that, that we, <laughs> that we think every company is the same. And so Morningstar actually has something called the uncertainty rating, which looks at that business risk and looks at, and that business risk can be financial. If a company has more debt, it is riskier. And the example I always use is during COVID, Australia had two airlines, well, one went out of business. Why is that? Neither of them were flying. Well, Virgin had a ton of debt. And so they obviously could not deal with the drop in revenue when nobody was flying. So I think it's just looking at all those different factors of a company and finding what you're comfortable in. And there is no right or wrong way to do that. So riskier companies have a wider range of outcomes. So one is that they can go bankrupt. One is, of course, they could turn into the next Apple. But Personally, I'm much more comfortable investing in companies with lower business risk. Now, that's just a personal thing, and that's, you know, I think maybe a lot of my experiences are, uh, have sort of led me down that path, but I think it's investors knowing what's in your portfolio, and knowing what's in your portfolio is not just sort of surface level thinking, okay, I kind of understand what this company does, I understand what they sell. It's really understanding the risks around that company. What's the competitive environment in that industry? And so I think that that's really the way that I like to look at my portfolio and look at it, those individual companies. Okay. Yeah. And Rachel, any sort of key metrics you look at when it comes to assessing risk? Yeah, I'd be just looking at percentages. I'd be getting back to the spreadsheet. I know initially you were saying, oh, you know, no. our spreadsheets are dated. <laughs> uh, I think there's Nothing great wrong. software, but there's also a great spreadsheet. So looking at that percentage weighting and back to that mining or banking or whatever it might be, really look at your sectors yeah. and look at your asset classes because each asset class is going to have a different risk tolerance as well. Mm.